So moved. Second. And all those in favor say aye. 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 We need a motion to approve the consent agenda. And on this agenda, it, on the consent agenda, we are accepting uh, grants that given to us by members of our community and organizations for uh, $14,500. So we thank all of our community because these things really do contribute to the program offerings that we have for our students. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 And now we have presentations, and look at all the people here to celebrate. Mark, so, I'll let you take um, it. This time is always a highlight of the meeting in which we're able to recognize some of the outstanding staff and students that we have here. So Kathy Nickleby, high school principal, will start the program with this. And then board members, would you please come to the front of the, the seats here? Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Larson, thank you for this opportunity to recognize some of our students at the high school. Tonight, I will ask Eve Farrell to join me at the podium. Eve is our Athena Award winner this year, and it recognizes our top senior athlete, female, our top female athlete <laughs> from the high school. Each high school in the Twin Cities area chooses one Athena a winner. Eve is the daughter of John Farrell and Katherine Bohr. She is a three-sport athlete, cross country, basketball, and track. She has been captain in all three sports. She has four letters in cross country, four letters in basketball, and five letters in track. She has received honorable mention all conference in cross country, basketball, and track. And she garnered an all conference recognition as a sophomore in track and this year in basketball. Eve has plans to continue her education at Carleton College in the fall. She will be recognized at a banquet on April 25th along with 45 other St. Paul area Athena winners. Congratulations. The next high school student I'd like to have join me at the podium is Bryce Huber. Bryce is our Chick Evans Caddy Scholarship, and it is a full tuition and housing college scholarship for golf caddies that is renewable for up to four years. Scholarship winners must have a strong caddy record excellent grades, and outstanding character. Applicants are evaluated and compete on this criteria. Finalists are interviewed, and the Evan Foundation Scholars Committee makes the final selection. They have certainly made a fantastic selection in our Matamidi High School senior, Bryce Huber. Whether he's on the wrestling mat, the Chautauqua stage, or the golf course, Bryce embodies all that the scholarship committee was looking for and is a huge asset to our community. We are lucky to have had him here at Matamidi, and the University of Minnesota will be better off for having him there in the next four years. Congratulations, Bryce. I'd like, and I'd like to invite Principal Bonds to the podium. Good evening, Madam Chair, respected school board members, Dr. Larson. It's my honor tonight to recognize Sarah Sadowski, third grade teacher at O.H. Anderson. She's making her way up here. Um, Sarah was recognized as a recipient of the Big 12 Conference College Football Foundation, not for her playing, um, but for its extra yard for teachers program. Sometimes as educators, and especially it can feel that way as elementary educators, we may not always know or see the impact that we have on students. And I think tonight's recognition really changes that. So former student Mimi Omot is currently a Baylor University Big 12 student athlete, and he was featured in its Champions for Life campaign. Mimi nominated Ms. Sadowski for making a lasting impact on him during his academic journey. In a short video that he taped for Sarah, these are his words. You've inspired me and have helped me so much. As a younger student and a kid who got in trouble a lot, you continue to always believe in me and you never gave up on me, and I really appreciate you for that. I know Sarah was very surprised when she received them. I can say I'm not, because I know that it's important to Sarah to make connections and relationships with kids. So I want to leave you with words that Sarah, Sarah, Sarah shared about this. And her message to students is, we are here for you, no matter whatever your journey or your story, we'll keep moving together. Congratulations, Sarah. I 
apologies. I'm supposed to introduce Mr. Michael Miller from the high school. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, tonight, we have the great opportunity of recognizing some students from our instrumental music program at the high school in Matamidae. Uh, first, tonight, I'd like to call up uh, the Metro East All-Conference Concert Band participants. Uh, the Metro East All-Conference Music Festival is something that we host here uh, for our Metro East Conference uh, in conjunction with St. Andrews to use their space. Uh, our conference really enjoys the fact that it's a wonderful evening of music making for uh, con our concert band students, our concert choir students, and also our jazz ensemble students from throughout our conference. Um, next year it'll be on Monday, January 14th, 2019. Starts at 7.30 if you want to get that on your calendar already. But this year's participants who we are honoring tonight um, range in age from uh, sophomores all the way through seniors in high school. They are, at, uh, they are student musicians who have been recognized recognized for their contributions both in their band programs here and also throughout the state in other music organizations. Tonight I have the distinct privilege of recognizing the following students in the concert band and jazz ensemble. First from the concert band, and they get to come up, correct, isn't it? <laughs> Addie Ingebrigtsen, Julia Ferrer, Megan Flick, Nathan Gregg, Abby Halverson, John Paul Heinzen, Jack Kalkman, Kyle Larson, Lucas Olson. From the Jazz Ensemble, Paxton Berger, Matthew Freeman, Nathan Gabriel, Connor Henningsen, Zach Houston, and Antonio Serini Johnson. There are a number of these students this, that are not with us tonight because they're representing our school district in their ultimate Frisbee competition. <laughs> and they are not here because, as, as a wonderful parent said to me on my way in, uh, they're covered from top to bottom in mud. So we're saving you that, that look, but they're out there uh, fighting for our honor on the ultimate Frisbee field. So you're all conference Metro East musicians from Matamide High School. The next student we're going to recognize is one who has not participated in this event, but it is coming up one week from Saturday and Sunday down at Cass and Manorville High School. The Minnesota Band Directors Association uh, every year holds a uh, state level honor band. Students submit an audition that they prepare ahead of time and they're selected. In the percussion section, they're selected from over 75 auditions uh, to select, and they select seven musicians. And so um, ninth grader Samuel Kalkman tonight is receiving recognition for his hard work, and he'll be representing Matamide High School at the 2018 Minnesota Band Directors Association State Honor Band coming up on April 21st and 22nd. So Samuel Kalkman, come on up. And our final recognition this evening uh, is a student who's, who's participating in Ultimate Frisbee right now. But is a student who submitted an audition last March about this time uh, for the Minnesota Music Education Association All-State uh, Concert Bands. In this case, in Minnesota, the Music Education Association has a symphonic band, a concert band, and then they have a jazz ensemble on the instrumental side of things, as well as a full orchestra and many choirs. But representing our, our school district and um, Huge kudos to this student being selected from uh, over over 250 musicians for this honor. Uh, John Paul Heinzen, who's not with us tonight because he's playing ultimate frisbee, but <laughs> for to recognize him. So thank you.
Pause a moment while our crowd leaves. <laughs> to know when we're going to honor the frisbee players <laughs> <laughs> if they do well maybe next time if they do well <laughs> yes i think just doing it huh. it's time for a student review. um good evening everyone i'm emma shores and tonight i have a lot to talk about as spring is always a very busy time in the high school and throughout the whole district so last week we had all school testing on on the third and so the juniors took the act and the underclassmen were taking MCAs. And the night before that, we had the first, um, or the NHS induction, the National Honor Society. And our new president is Christine Brennan, and the vice president is Lizzie Kangas. And our first meeting is tomorrow, so the new season for that is kicking in. Um, a lot of spring sports are starting. I know the middle school, high school sports started um, after spring break. and. Uh, due to the snow, a lot of events have had to be canceled, like our track meet last week. But the girls and boys lacrosse team, as well as the track team, have cleared off all the snow on the track, so we can actually use it. Um, this week or this Friday is night at the theater, and it's at seven, and it's going to raise money for the high school theater department. And then also the Beauty and the Beast play is going to be May 3rd through the 6th. So that's coming up if you want to put that in your calendars. Um, another important thing to note is that the new um, school board representative was elected on Wednesday, Luke Wisniewski. And we also elected <laughs> the new um, SLC <laughs> presidents. Um, one of them is me, another is Grace Carpenter. And then the vice presidents are Sekmini Nagunu and Claire Houtman. And we're really excited for our new um, council to begin after prom. And really, that's it. I mean, people are getting antsy here, but it's exciting. Thank you. Yeah. We're sorry to see you go, Emma, but we're looking forward to your replacement. <laughs> Shut <Shucks. Yeah. laughs> We need a motion to approve the March 8th minutes and the March 22nd minutes. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, calendar of events. Some things I'd like to draw your attention to in here. Um, Emma already mentioned the play coming up, but there's a lot of other things that are happening. Uh, just next week, we have the Celebration of Excellence on May 18th. On the 19th, we have the Century College 50th Anniversary Celebration and 20th, a Wildwood Family Fun Fair. It's a great event. Um, there's one other thing that I'd like to invite all of the community to, and that's the uh, Adult Community Senior Lunch. Uh, the middle school glee club will be performing, and they uh, they did great last week. We last month rather, we had uh, Zephyr Seven, a jazz band that was also performing at the lunch, and it was just terrific. Seven dollars, and it's at noon on Wednesday, May second. We're doing a lot of work with equity, and one of the pieces that we're doing is going to be uh, poverty simulation. 
on Tuesday, May 1st from 4 to 8 p.m. It's for staff members, but it's something that we'll be t doing to get a sense of the different kind of diversity that we oftentimes overlook, and that's the situation of poverty. Um, there's plays and band concerts and a whole host of other things that are coming up. Please take advantage of some of the outstanding entertainment that we have here. Does anybody want to call out anything else? Or getting for the right of spring. Yeah. <laughs> I just created a Facebook page, um, uh, Modern Yeti Right of Spring 2018. I'm on the Environmental Commission for the, uh, the City Council and Advisory uh, Body. And uh, every year, as most of you know, we do the Right of Spring. It's held right here in the, uh, in, at the District Education Center. And this year, we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to have some speakers. We're going to have uh, some, some electric cars. We're going to have a tiny house. We're going to have, um, have it more focused into primarily the gym area and this this room for specific things and um, I'm gonna have my sound system here so people can for speakers I could play guitar but I don't know I think there's some ASCAP rules about that but um, I would like you to all try to come it's gonna be on the 28th it's from 10 to 1 this year instead of 9 to noon and um, from 8 to 2 there will be uh, Washington County uh, hazardous waste recycling and uh, uh, the other ones paper recycling I think um, there's gonna Huh? Medication. Medication drop off again if you have unused. The sheriff department will be right here in the doorway. And uh, there will be available, now, I don't know about the sheriff, but the outdoor ones, the drive up things are open that day. So spread the word, come on out. It should be pretty fun. We're trying to bring a lot more young people in as volunteers and to uh, make it more bistro style event. All right. Hey, I have one more Thanks. thing. Um, also on April 28th is the May Legacy Night. So at JX Center at uh, 6 o'clock, right, Kevin? 5 o'clock. Five for cocktails? For the pre-party. Okay. And the other important thing to note is there are only 70 tickets left. So if you have not purchased tickets and you intend to purchase tickets, you can go online and get that done, but I would get it done soon. There's, there's um, just a, a couple other things if people want to put this on the calendar. May 16th is Scholarship Night, and the 17th is Hill Legacy Night. So just for future planning. Okay, anything else? All right. Launch and Learn, Kathy. Good evening again. With the budget discussion, one of the things that we have had over the past two years, we've been looking at Lunch and Learn for three years, we've implemented it fully this year, is that we had 0.4 FTE allocated to help organize, coordinate, research, and implement the Lunch and Learn. With the upcoming budget cuts, we had to look at what, what can we do differently. And uh, let's see. I found the mouse. Okay, there we go. So let's go back and look at what Lunch and Learn is. When we first took on this journey to, Im to embed time in the day, it was to focus on how we can help our students through academic support, to reduce some student stress, time in the day for students to make up work, retakes, or individual learning as they need it, our college and career readiness counselor, and for opportunities for stu students to connect in clubs, activities, athletics, over common interests. It has taken us a little while to get where we are this year, but it has been very successful, and I give much of the credit to Courtney McCormick and Matt Huss, as they have been phenomenal in implementing and coordinating the whole program. Looking at, whoop, let me go back one. There we go, oh, there we go. So how do we implement Lunch and Learn? Right now, we have a program because of the research that was done to create the program. We visited many other schools, we found models out there, and we have been adjusting it to make it work for Matamidi High School. We have built the schedule based on staff and student input. That means we have a general supervision schedule because when you have 1,200 students roaming about the cabin or the building, you have to have adults to make sure that everybody's. We match teacher availability with student needs, whether that's a club, whether that's an academic session, whether it's a activity, whatever it might be, we try to make sure that there's time in that week for students to meet with that teacher. And we try to balance the building usage each block so that not all the students are in the lunchroom at the same time. We have created and maintained a platform for schedule and communication through a website 
advisory announcement, door signs, and bulletin boards. And the execution of lunch and learn time has been supervision of spaces both blocks. So what that means is we divide the hour in the day to A and B. And during that time, every staff member, teachers, would have time for ha lunch. So they might eat A, and then they would either supervise or provide additional academic support or lead a club during the other half of the time. And so we've had to coordinate all of those things. And then, of course, there's always things with a new program that you have to troubleshoot. And we've been working on that, and we feel that we are at a really good place. With the advent of um, the point four. Uh, our goal is through administration. Patrick, are you uh, doing it with me? <laughs> Let's go back a slide. There, or go up three. All right. So the high school administration. <laughs> Would you like any questions? <laughs> slide. All right. Our goals for the next year are to keep lunch and learn within the school day. We had toyed with some options. Would it be better to put it at the beginning of the day, the end of the day, to alleviate some of the scheduling requests that we have to maintain? And our goals for next year are to keep lunch and learn within the school day, to keep the clubs and activity options open for our students, and of course, to keep that academic enhancement option. We haven't quite worked out all the details. It currently is allocated to be a four hour a day commissioners that are doing it. So we'll have to figure out how we can continue moving the program forward without allocating four hours a day from one administrator. And because Matt and Courtney have done such a great job building it, we believe that we can do that. Whoop. Patrick, you want to take me to the question slide? I'm going to leave my hands off the mouse. Okay. There we go. What questions do you have for me? Very, very well received, valuable program, and I think everybody sort of has a sigh of relief. It's going to stay. And any time there's a change as significant as the changes we're going to be embracing over the next year, it takes a little while to talk about options and how we can the day for our kids. And so we're at this point. I don't have the details worked out 100 percent, but we're on our way. So, Kevin. Kevin. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I just, uh, you know, I've heard good things from both students and staff. <laughs> and uh, thank you for the affirmation. That's great. Um, and one of the things is, have we uh, fully maximized the benefit of the lunch and learn? And one of the things I've been thinking about, and I'd be curious about uh, how far we've gone down this road, but the career pathways initiative through the Chamber of Commerce um, with the idea of having speakers come in from various businesses and careers that could come and talk to students that had an interest in uh, fabrication, nursing, whatever the career pathway might do. It have, are we seeing people come in to do that? And, and if so, then uh, how many would you guesstimate that we've seen this year? We have had some visitors that come in during Lunch and Learn, and that's been organized through Ellen Cole, our college and career counselor. I don't have the numbers offhand. I know that if we could expand that, we, we would, because it's a great opportunity for our students. Okay, so, so I don't have a number for so you. So if, if the chamber and people that are in business would like to come, we would be receptive to... Oh. We'll, we'll coordinate it, though. Just awesome. let us know I, you're coming. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And when you talk about the, the challenges and the things that we can do better, one of the areas that we have that we're still working on and we haven't found the perfect solution yet is there, are, there may be a body of students that could use some academic support, but because it is a free-flowing time, it's difficult to get them to get that academic support when they can be in the lunchroom for the entire hour or the media center, and that's still an area that we can work on and get better at. Um, in the programs, when you did all of your research before you started, did the schools that had this program before allocate FTE, or were administrators administrating the program? The schools that we visited and we talked to, they hired an administrator to oversee the 
uh, the full-time administrator? It would depend on the size of the school. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But some schools have hired a full-time administrator to oversee the program. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, we have a second reading of policy 524 which is a technology acceptable use policy thank you uh, madam chair members of the board um, this is a, a policy that is view, reviewed annually it was before the policy committee but then it was sent back with some other uh, suggestions and corrections to work on we got some feedback from minnesota school boards association and also patrick Crothers, our technology coordinator also provided some i just want to read to you these very quickly uh, on the first page, 524.1, um, you cannot use the internet or email for advertising purposes or to promote personal causes. The part that we've added is without prior approval from school or district administration. We have a monthly uh, staff newsletter and we allow staff to advertise things for sale. So by putting this in there, then we make that okay to do that. Um, we don't want people to buy my girl, my kids Girl Scout cookies or my other kids fundraising things. Oh, you're we, want to, we want to eliminate that as much as we can, but we do have a spot for those things and that's the first part. And um, then if you turn to page four, 524.4, it had said users will not save personal photos, music files, et cetera, unrelated to educational purposes on district share home folder for an extended period of time. We've eliminated that. A lot of people have screen savers of their kids or pictures of their children or something like that. That's really reasonable to have that. Um, and then we also have the personal data, including photos, my, music files, et cetera. They saved in a workstation. They may be removed if they degrade the performance of the system. Um, I forgot up on number eight above that. Users must keep all account information and passwords on file with the designated school district. Uh, official we don't do that um, the people are responsible for their own passwords and um, the tech department will have them if necessary but we don't keep them on file so we're eliminating that as well um, we're looking at now page 524 6 um, uh, this is about the filter that we have as a filter um, we eliminated number three taken as a whole lack serious literary artistic political or scientific value as to minors that's a real tough one to judge we can uh, uh, easily judge the ones above it in terms of the filter about obscenities and child pornography or harmful to minors um, but taking as a whole the lacking serious is something that's difficult and so we're taking that out and then at letter D a member of the technology department an administrator supervisor other person authorized by the superintendent may disable the technology perfect, uh, protection um, I can tell you that the superintendent does not know how to disable the technology protection and it would have to be a member of the technology department and I believe the administrators don't know how either and so <laughs> this is just a clarification for that. And then finally on the page 524.8, um, the letter D, the computer systems internet use agreement for, form for employees must be signed by the employee upon hire um, or change in policy and then we added annually thereafter and this is part of the back to school packet. So these are the changes that we've had from the first reading to now and then I'm, if there are no suggestions from the school board members we'll bring it back for a third reading in May and if there are suggestions we'll still bring it back for a third reading but we'll incorporate those anybody all right superintendent search update all right so in your packet I had um, two documents printed and put at your spots um, one is the updated timeline and so the items in yellow on the updated timeline that looks like this are things where the board is involved and so those are the items um, the search committee would like us pay particular attention to so the first couple the first one is done um, what happens next is I have been meeting with Patty from Springstead on a weekly basis to get updates and work with her on questions she has. She's also been very much involved with Lynn Viker and Nicole Flessner, and um, they've been providing her with information and um, pieces of, of things she needs as well, um, pushing information for the website, those kinds of things. So the advertisement did close today, isn't today the 12th? Yes. Yep. Tonight it closes. Um, as of about an hour before the meeting, though, we had 30 complete applications. So that's really good. Um, Patty seems to think that we have a lot of very good people in the pool, which is good. She's been monitoring those as, as they've come in. She's been talking to candidates as, as they've called. So on the 26th, or on the 20th, the 20th, we will have delivered to us booklets. Um, that contain information on the semi-finalists semi that they will provide for us. They'll provide us a, a complete list of the 30 applicants and then additional paperwork on those finalists. And then on the 26th from that, we will need to review those finalists and move people forward for interviews, and you can see the rest of the timeline there. 
The other thing we've worked a lot on the past week or so, especially with help from Lynn and Nicole, is to create two additional interview committees. And so when the candidates come in for their interviews on April 30th and May 2nd, it will have three panels. There will be a panel of teachers and administrators who will interview, and those people have been selected based upon building representation, different academic areas. Um, so that's been put together, and those people should be contacted this week, I believe. Um, people will need to be able to attend both dates uh, to fully participate in the process. The other panel will be community and students. And so we have a group of community members that represent a cross-section of our community, as well as a group of students from the high school. Um, that have been selected. Thank you again to Lynn and Nicole, um, because I don't know everyone at the high school <laughs> or the community, and so their input has been very helpful. Um, and then you can see from there what happens. The candidates will be reviewed based upon the other document I gave you is the um, brochure. So if you remember at our last meeting, we had four pages that we looked at and reviewed for the brochure. And as Patty and I worked that a little bit more, our question was, who's going to read four pages <laughs> to decide if they want to apply to be our superintendent? And it helped us focus it a little bit based on the feedback that was given the candidate profile on the back side. We were able to condense down um, based upon a lot of the work Dr. Larson has done with us in terms of thinking about superintendent competencies and the information from the interviews done with each of us individually and um, administrators within the district. And so this candidate profile is what they will use to do that initial screen for us. And so we just took that long list that was pretty much a full page and tried to summarize and condense it down to bigger, broader ideas instead of a list of 30 things. Now it's much more concise. Um, let's see what else I have. Um, the timeline sh should be going to the website if it's not already up. Um, the print brochure has been shared, and I think that's it. Any questions? Good work, Lucy. Hmm? Yeah. Thank you. Finance Committee update, Mark. Thank you. I have some information to share. Based, this is a little bit of a summary of the last meeting that we just had. Uh, we had the Finance Committee meeting prior to this. And uh, the information here is about the levy planning portion of it. The Finance Committee had two main portions of their meeting tonight. The first one was about the budget. You'll hear from Bill Manazzi, Director of Business Services, a little bit later on to take action. And this is kind of a summary of the things that we talked about earlier on this afternoon, or this not too long ago. One of the key points that we want to make is that the federal revenue, the other local revenue, and the state aid accounts for 79% of the referendum re, uh, the revenue that the school district has the local levy the referendum is only 21 percent but that's the 21 percent that we're going to be talking about and the importance of making sure that we're able to su have a successful levy campaign a little bit of background on this is that we have had in the last five years at last eight years rather we've had four different levy campaigns a building bond which passed in 2010 the capital levies project in 2011 also passed that's also called the technology project uh, I'll be speaking to that in more detail later. 2013 and 14, we had the operating levy. On the far left of the screen, you see that it says the 2014, when the levy passed, it generates $744 of voter approved. The school district gets a total of 1044 because the school board has in their authority the ability to put under school board control of $300. And so when you look at this slide here, you'll see that Matamidi generates $1,044 per student. Remember, this is only 21% of our total revenue. Um, this is a comparison of the other area school districts. These are some outliers and some of the some districts on the um, western side, Edina and Minnetonka, particularly are quite high. Orono is above the cap. They've been grandfathered in, and the cap is $1,967. And as you can see, there were a little bit more than half below that. So we're quite a ways below in terms of where we are. We conducted a survey from Springstead, and as you can tell here, the first question is basically asking just would you be supportive of a levy, uh, a higher amount to generate additional revenue? 
based on what you know now, would you approve or disapprove? 58% were in favor of it, 27% were opposed, and then 15 didn't know. Um, this is important in that um, this is higher than we had it in 2013 and 2014. 58% uh, is a high number, um, and this is without having any information. And then what we did is we asked people, some gave them scenarios. If the levy passes, we'll be able to do these things. If the levy fails, we'll have to do these things. And so the initial support of 58% jumped up to 64%. So it's very important that the community is educated as to what are some of the important issues, both the positive uh, consequences of a passage and the negative consequences if it happens to fail. These are the things that people we asked specifically about what would make a difference if you were to, does this, gener does this resonate with you if we were to provide more math and reading specialists for struggling learners? Um, as you can see, that was the highest one. That was one got the most support. Uh, strengthen our engineering program. That also got a lot of support. Strengthen the STEM program. Um, we asked the question in two ways. One was engineering for some people and some one was STEM for other people, depending upon which one they knew. Improving security high. And, and um, this was before the Parkland situation that the survey was out. And so this was also a high answer. Um, the potential negative consequences. These are listed here. Uh, the one that resonates most with people is increasing class sizes. It's something that they don't want to see happen. Likewise, you don't want to reduce the specialists for struggling learners, or do you want to reduce the gifted and talented programs? So this information is really helpful in terms of crafting a message and in sharing with what the community feels is important. So that's the first part of it. And then you had to get into a little bit more specific in terms of what would happen if your property taxes were increased 125, 175, or 150. Um, Springstead asks the question not in always starting lowest to highest, but sometimes it's middle, then low, then high. They have a random way of doing this. And so that they do it in a random order, hopefully not to have people just choose the middle one. Um, but what you can see here is that based on the survey results, if there was a $125 tax impact, almost two-thirds of the people would support that. $150 tax impact, 53%. Um, and then Springstead recommends in the $135 to $140 per year for the owner of an average priced home. So that's the point where they are. The other question that was very important that we asked was about an escalating levy. And this has also been called a tiered levy. And this is when you'll have a set amount for three years. The board would determine the amount. But generally, it's the first three years, it's X amount. The next three years, it's X plus a certain amount, so X plus another $150, say. And then the third year is another you know, $150 or $200 additional. Um, this is very similar to an inflationary increase. When we passed the levy in 2014, we said that we'd have to be going back out to the voters. This would prevent that from happening um, if it were to pass because we would be able to have built-in increases. And so the question is if that you knew this up front, would you favor or oppose a proposal that would do this? And again, 58% were supportive of it. 11% didn't know and 31% were against it. Um, but that's surprisingly high, according to what Springstead told us, that 58% of the automatic tax increase uh, people still did support. So the question is that what would this look like? And here are three different scenarios. Uh, the first thing is that $350,000 is the average home uh, value in the Montemedi School District. And the blue bar on that is our current what it is, it's $582. And then if it were to go up by $127.47, that's the reddish pink one. And then again, you can see the, the green and the purple. Um, and that's what the numbers that would escalate. At the very bottom, you see that it's $800,000. That's the $800,000 option. Um, and that would generate an additional $800,000 based on $127.47. And then one million is over on 159, and then 1.2 million all the way over on $191. Uh, the Springstead survey indicated that they thought it should be between the 800 and the $1 million mark, uh, probably trending toward, as I mentioned earlier, about $140 in that neighborhood. One other thing that we do need to talk about, and I teased it up, teed it up a little bit with the uh, tech levy that was passed in 2011. Uh, we did pass the first levy in 2001, and that generated $614,000. And the money that was generated was because of property values. With the housing bubble hit and uh, the taxes, uh, because of the value, we generated less funding. And so now, um, in 2017-18, it generates approximately 618000 
And so in 16 or 17 years here, we've generated um, an additional $4,000. This is in spite of the fact that we have added so many different things from computers and uh, smart books and notebooks and iPads and Chromebooks to all the infrastructure pieces. It's been a really huge amount of expense in generating a lot of things that we've had to do. In addition, we've also cut back on some of our staffing. In 2001, we had five technology employees. Now we only have four. Um, you heard about safety earlier on and physical plant security is a big issue. A lot of it's been done with our cameras and our security system that way. But we also have needs for digital security and those needs are increasing. Now we certainly have believed all along that technology is an accelerator of learning, but it does require staff development and we've been a little bit neglectful in that because we haven't had the funds to implement that. In addition, the implementation and support of Google Apps for education, all the staff and students, that requires a lot of training. We do have some work that needs to be done in this. And then on April 28th, two weeks from tonight, we're having our board meeting and at that point we'll be talking about this in a little bit more detail and we'll also be having our security audit. Um, the board will get information about that. Um, this is an issue that we do need to talk about and decide if this is going to be part of the tech levy, uh, or te part of the operating levy, if it's going to be a separate question, if it's not going to be at all, if we're going to wait to 2021. So there's a lot of things that we have to have be thinking about in the next six weeks before we make a final decision. One of the things that we mentioned quite a lot at the Finance Committee meeting earlier on was simple facts about Matamida is receiving about $1,200 less per student in the metro average. Um, and also, if the state had kept up with funding in inflation, uh, we would be receiving about $600 more per student than it does now. Um, if we were receiving the same as the metro area and, or, excuse me, or if the state had kept up with their obligation, just keeping up with inflation, we would not be talking about a levy. But the fact is, is that because of those two things, and there are other factors too, um, you heard earlier on the Finance Committee about the cross-education subsidy. Neither the federal government nor the state government has kept up with their obligation to fully support special education services. So we subsidize that with the general fund. It's money well spent, and I think we should, but I really wish that the state and the federal government would take care of their share. If that were to happen, we would also not be talking about this. But anyway, we shared this information with the uh, people that were, com were polled. And if the state funding had kept up with $600 per student just behind inflation, um, that is a, a convincing argument. And in fact, it makes people, um, again, right in that 58% area, support the levy that much more. Um, and so that's a positive statement. And then when you look at what happens if the district got the same um, as the metro area, that is also 53%. So the inflation seems to make more sense than comparing it to the metro average. Finally, we did not talk about this at the Finance Committee, but to find out, um, grading the district. We asked the question in the survey about if you were to give the school district a grade A, B, or C, D, or F, what would you uh, give the district? And 68%, a very high number compared to a lot of other districts, this is according to what Springstead told us, uh, we're giving the district an A or a B. Um, and as you can see, the A is the largest one, 41%. 19% of the uh, participants could not offer a response. Um, and that's telling because that means that there needs to be some education that happens with those folks. Um, a couple other things that were mentioned that I do want to draw people's attention to is the fact that um, about 70% of, the, resident, of the, the residents in the district do not have children in the school. And most of the people hear their information about the school either from their own experience, their children's experiences, or friends and neighbors. So it's really important to make sure that people are aware of the things that are going on. That's why we have the Globe. That's why we have letters to the editor. And that's why we have um, columns in the White Bear Press. And we have the weekly newsletters that go out to all the families in the Wildwood Wind and the O.H. Anderson Little Zeph Gazette and a lot of different ways to communicate to people. We need to keep telling our story because when people hear the great successes that our students have in the academics and as you heard tonight in the arts and the impact that teachers have as you hear about them being recognized from a student from who was a college student now recognizing an elementary teacher it's pretty remarkable um, so very pleased that the school district is graded so highly the other question then is about do you trust the district to manage money um, and this is also very very telling as you look here over two-thirds of the people strongly agree or agree that the district knows how to manage money um, the no response is the um, third largest and that's at 15%. Um, and they just, those people just don't know. So it's similar to the ones um, that don't know about the, the, grade of the, the grade of the school district. 
The next thing is about the quality of the financial management. And this gets into the point about, do you trust the school district to manage the money? And then if you do or don't, what do you think about the, how, they, how well they manage the money? And as you can see here, it's 61% of the respondent A or B. So clearly the school board, the community has confidence in the school board, their ability to manage the funds. Clearly the community thinks that the school district is very effective and clearly they trust the school district to manage money. Um, we need to continue to be fiscally responsible um, and that's part of the whole conversation with the levy as to where we are. Um, and then the planning for the future. A lot of the financial people my take on this question is about quality of planning for the future, largely in a financial sense. But the question did not ask that specifically. It could just be about planning, planning for the future in terms of are we doing things on the cutting edge. So for example, um, we've done a lot of work with engineering and is that, that might be something that people are thinking about. But regardless, the school, the community feels that 70% of the residents who responded give us an A or B for quality of planning for the future. Again, a very positive thing. So all of this information is very positive, but we still have some tough decisions ahead of us. We need to figure out what is an appropriate amount of money to ask. We need to decide if we want to go with a tiered approach or an escalating levy. And we do need to decide what we want to do about technology and the needs that we have there. And so our process is the next steps. April 26th, we have a school board study session. We'll be discussing it there. Well, at that point, we'll also have a draft resolution for you. And we'll also have a draft of some school district ballot. Uh, the, the, this is way early. The election's not until November 6th. But we want to get this out. And we'll not be acting on it. We'll not be making any decisions. But we'll have a draft. And the school board could look at that. At that point, we should also have a tax impact calculator. That's a button on the website that you'll click on. My house is valued at X amount. And this is what you can expect to pay with taxes. We'll have a draft of that. It won't be finalized. And before the school board meeting, we'll be having the technology, as I mentioned, the security audit update. And then our next meeting is May 10th. Um, we're going to answer follow-up questions as needed from the April 26th, April 26th meeting, and we'll have those prepared then. Um, I was originally hoping that we could have a decision made on May 10th. Um, that's too aggressive in terms of a timeline. May 24th is the time to do that. We can decide in August, but I believe it's best to have our decision made on May 24th as to what we want to do. That would be the action determining the necessity for revoking our existing levy and then approving a new revenue, a uh, new rever referendum revenue authorization, and then the special election. And so we'll have all of those things and we take action on May 24th. If it gets to the point where we're not able to get those things done, we can act in June, but I do think that May 24th is the time to do that. And then finally, uh, Bill Manazzi has uh, shared this before. And so I copied this slide from him. Um, some of the results that we've had here, um, just some of the outstanding quality. Um, we have a school district in which we have outstanding student achievement. We have outstanding educators. We are really, really high ranked and we do it less expensively and we get less money than a lot of the other area school districts. So we have a lot to be proud of, but we do need, as you'll hear when we get to the budget reductions, we do need to have a levy for the 2018 school year. Um, any questions or comments on that? Any additional questions or comments? We did discuss this and we looked at, we've looked at these numbers, we've looked at these slides um, a couple of times now that we've seen these productions. So we may not have too many questions at this time, but does anybody have a question or comment that they'd like to share? It's, none of it's new information to any of us. We have some action items tonight. One is uh, a contract bid for lighting in the theater. Uh, Madam Chair and members of the board, we had this on the agenda because we called for bids. Um, and then, but what happened is, is that we had one bid uh, that was sealed and it came in much higher than expected. And so our recommendation is to reject the bid and then we will uh, pursue the funding that was required in a different way. We're going to do two different things with it. One is that we'll have Julie Osterbauer and Bill Manazzi and A.J. Fossen uh, reevaluate the specific lighting, look at a different bidding process. Maybe we'll just uh, order the materials through a state-generated contract and then figure out how to install them. Um, but the bid that just came in was um, so we're rejecting the bid. And the board uh, needs to take action and just accept the fact that we would reject the bid as presented. Need a motion to reject Moved. the bid? Is there a second? Second. Any additional discussion? So we will continue with the project. It will just be a different pathway. Yes. Okay. Anything else? All in favor of rejecting the bid? Say aye. 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 Opposed? 
we have to approve some annually uh, uh, review policies. Do we have to approve these every single year? Tonight's tonight. Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair, members of the board. These are policies that are annually reviewed. They've been before the policy committee. Uh, they have been before the administration. They have had a first reading and they've had a second reading. The annual policies that have had no changes from any of those times are policy 410, family and medical leave, policy 414, mandated reporting of child neglect or physical or sexual abuse, policy 415, mandated reporting of maltreatment of vulnerable adults, policy 506, student discipline, policy prohibition, Policy 522, student sex non-discrimination. Policy 616, school district system accountability. Policy 806, crisis management. We had three policies that are also annually reviewed, but these policies had changes. They have not had any changes from the second reading until now. And that's policy 213, school board committees. Policy 533, wellness. And policy 613, graduation requirements. This is the third reading and they've been before the board several times. The recommendation is to approve as presented. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Again, we have seen these a number of times. All those in favor of accepting all of these, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, we have to approve our budget reductions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, like uh, Director of Business Management Services, Bill Manazzi, do you come forward and share with us the information? This information, again, is, is not new. Um, it's been before the board for some time. Uh, we talked about it at length at the studies, at the, excuse me, at the Finance Committee meeting beforehand. And uh, so, Bill, would you go over it again, please? So, Manazzi. Good evening, Madam Chair, Superintendent Larson, members of the school board. Included in your school board packet and up on the screen tonight, you'll find the 2018-19 budget reduction recommendations for school board action. This is really a culmination and a summary of the work and presentations prepared since last November of 2017. As Director of Business Services, I'm tasked with presenting this document and the related recommendations, uh, but this is really a summary of a much larger group um, and to that end, uh, the building administration is here tonight to help me and answer any questions that I cannot. Um, so what I'd like to review, do is review the enclosed document, take any questions that you uh, may have before seeking uh, school board approval. Obviously, the 2018-19 general fund budget process has been lengthy and, and very emotional for the community, staff, administration, and the school board. This has been both a challenging process and a challenging dollar amount. Um, although challenging, our hope is that the uh, adjustments made now will help our school district become a more sustainable and fiscally responsible as we look toward opportunities to improve our educational experience in the future. As we all know, the initial forecast for 2018-19 estimated a budget shortfall in the, uh, in the neighborhood of 1.6 million. We really narrowed in on that target, and that's the number that everybody's been familiar with since last November. Since that time, uh, the enrollment target has been addressed at length, and it's been set at 3,288 for next year. The 3,288 is getting back to the levels of 2015-16, which is the last time the school district had a balanced budget. There have been other uh, changes and adjustments uh, done uh, since November, uh, including but certainly not limited to uh, QCOMP subsidy decreases, labor settlements, early retirement incentives, and eliminating some contracts for next year. After uh, the enrollment target's been set and all of the other adjustments have been made, we've narrowed in and, and uh, focused in on, on a budget shortfall for next year in the neighborhood of $1 million. We're recommending the following budget reductions for next year, and what you see in front of you tonight has a balanced budget for 2018-19. What I'd like to do is go over uh, building by building uh, many of the, uh, much of the information that you see in your packet and up on the screen has not changed since uh, March 22nd study session. Some of it has and I'll highlight the changes and then at the end take any questions before seeking approval. At Wildwood in kindergarten, the recommendation is no change. We have nine sections this year. Our recommendation is to stay with nine sections. Target enrollment of 185. Average class size for next year would be 20.5 students. In first grade, the recommendation is no change. 
eight sections, target enrollment of 196, average class size of 24 and a half. And then in second grade, this is a change from what you saw at the end of March at the study session. The recommendation is no change, eight sections, target enrollment of 192, average class size of 24. If we did eliminate that eighth section in second grade and went with seven sections, class size in second grade would increase from, tw from 24 to 27 and a half for next year, so you can see the impact. Uh, what you see in administrative restructuring is new, so I'd like to go over it. Uh, in order to preserve sections, as I mentioned, in a difficult financial year, particularly in pain points of second grade and fifth grade, the recommendation is to move the Director of Teaching and Learning and Accountability to Wildwood in lieu of immediately replacing the, uh, the Wildwood principal for a period up to but not to exceed one year for 2018-19. When we're done, if there are questions, we can circle back to enrollment and how that plays a factor in, in the Wildwood principal position. As I mentioned, in recommending this change, we're able to maintain sections in second and fifth grade and lessen the class sizes. In the event that we add 18 to 20 students over the summer, bringing total enrollment to up to uh, uh, about 3310, we could reduce, reduce both the class sizes in second grade and fifth grade and still have a full-time principal uh, for the start of the 1819 school year. What we want to do is be cognizant to the target set by the school board at 3288 and not keep the sections of second to fifth grade, replace the principal, and add the students as a way to do that. We want to be respectful of the target set, and if that target is to increase, that's something that we want to communicate at the board level. Obviously, the change, if it stays with the Wildwood principal, would require a one-year hold and some um, spread responsibilities on things like curriculum development and review and, and also staff development and training opportunities for next year. Um, and we have, not, we have not figured out how all that plays out. Uh, we'll have to figure that out as, as time goes on. O.H. Anderson, the recommendation in third grade is no change. Eight sections, target enrollment of 204, average class size of 25 and a half. Fourth grade, no change. Nine sections, target enrollment of 239, average class size of 26 and a half. Those third and fourth had not changed from what you've seen uh, uh, since March 22nd. Fifth grade, this is the, the grade that changed since the last time uh, we discussed this. The recommendation now is uh, nine sections, target enrollment of 236, average class size of 26.2. As you recall from March, uh, with uh, reducing a section in fifth grade, class sizes could approach 30 at, at uh, just about 29.6 estimated. For the specialist position, we're recommending a .2 FTE Spanish reduction. Uh, at O.H. Anderson, and I did accidentally skip over the uh, specialist point two reduction at Wildwood too. That was not, certainly not intentional. The reductions in the secondary are, are largely unchanged since what you saw at the end of March, so I won't go over them line item by line item. I do want to highlight um, what uh, Principal Nickleby discussed earlier. Um, so we had a conversation at the end of March about lunch and learn. Uh, and, and we heard about the value, and certainly we, under, we understand the value of lunch and learn. Um, in order to keep class sizes reasonable for next year, the lunch and learn teaching staff is going back into the classroom. Uh, if we added lunch and learn to the duties of the new uh, administration, in this case we're talking about the athletic and activities director, uh, it would allow us to keep the program, allow for supervision and program management by an administrator, and provides administrative restructuring. In order to do this, we would need to replace that person at a 1.0 FTE, which currently exists. You can see our other reductions, uh, a 1.0 reduction in the QCOMP coach due to a retirement, and the elimination of the DMG contract for next year. And then we have some small decreases related to a si cell phone stipend that we discussed at length at the Finance Committee meeting earlier tonight. Finally, before uh, taking questions and seeking approval, I'd just like to talk about next steps. Uh, you can see the statute up there uh, that states that the school board is required to appro approve the preliminary budget for the upcoming school year by June 30th. Obviously, sitting here on April 12th, April t yep, April 12th, <laughs> we're well ahead of June 30th. Uh, the reason for that is really that we're in sort of a, a different year this year. So what we'd like to do is, um, get the general fund uh, budget recommendations um, set tonight. That way we can start to focus in on some of the non-major governmental funds, things like food service, community education, 
debt service, OPEB. We really haven't had a chance to look at that because we spent quite a bit of time, as we should, on enrollment and general fund budget. What we'd like to do is spend some time in, in the later parts of April and into May on those other governmental funds, package everything up and present it for a formal approval on June 14th, which would leave us one board meeting in June uh, if we needed to circle back and, and do any last minute on the budget to get it approved by June 30th. Um, that's all I had from a presentation standpoint. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. And as I mentioned, the, the building administration is here to help with any questions that I cannot answer on, on building uh, recommendations. First of all, thank you. I want to thank Dr. Larson and Lynn and you and everyone else who had input on this. I appreciate the work you've done since the last time we met. A um, <clears throat> couple of things. One, I, I really appreciate that you work to find a way, thinking outside of the box. I know I said this earlier, but just want to repeat it, that um, to get the average class size um, lowered in second and fifth grade from the first proposal. I think we've seen from our community survey, from people who have shown that they'll be helpful uh, with our potential levy, everyone has indicated that class size is, is top of mind. And that's a big reason why people are in our district. So I really appreciate that you found a way to, um, to make it so that we didn't have to go up to those really high numbers. Um, I do have a question. It says, if 18 to 20 students moved in, you could hire a new principal. Is that the first priority, or, or it, could it be if 18 to 20 people moved in, we could fund some of these other things that, um, you know, we're, we're losing a lot at the high school? So I just would like your perspective on that. I can address part of that and tell you that part of it is undecided. I can tell you that it, it's going to depend on where we get the move-ins. Um, if the move-ins are largely in the middle school, we'll have to address how that impacts class size. Mm -hmm. If the move-ins are... K-5, um, then, then we'll look um, in, in Wildwood or O.H. Anderson. Beyond that, what item in the particular buildings we would add back first, if you will, we just haven't, we haven't gotten to that point. Okay. I just want to make sure, I don't think anyone, because when we approve this, I just, I don't want it to be uh, mistakenly assumed that that's our first priority is to if there's that many move-ins I'd like for it to be a little clearer that um, it, it will be all, everything will be everything will be on the table so because I think you've found a way to address that need for the year and so if there are other needs that we could address that maybe um, uh, you know aren't mentioned here I just I just don't that language kind of sends a message that that's our first priority and it, since we're voting on this I want to make sure that language gets cleared up if that's okay if everyone else is on board Other comments? I have a couple comments I'm going to start with the administrative restructuring I appreciate um, the way Dr. Larson has addressed um, the concerns of, of the board and, and thinking about administrative cuts and thinking about the study that was done and, and looking at administrative restructuring I would hope that the board would look at that and say we agree with the concept of administrative restructuring, but I don't think it's our job to say it should be this one person. I think that's an administrative decision um, because with the timeline that's been handed all of us, there hasn't been a lot of time for all thought and looking at potential solutions. So I would hope that we would approve this administrative restructuring in concept, but still leave it to the administration to find the best administrative restructure to make that happen and not lock us into a decision this early when we don't need to be. So I think I would agree with that. I just would like to be clear that I do want the, re the administrative restructuring to be part of yes. how we address it. I think that was something that we've all heard loud and clear. I think it's something that's important to all of us. Our teachers have certainly taken a, their share of, of the burden of this, and so I appreciate that the administration is seeking a way to do it. So as long as the language still captures right. that. I think it's the concept we, we should yeah. approve, but not the details. I think the details have the potential to change and shift. I think um, as we look at that next paragraph underneath that, um, Again, going back to your question, I mean, our target number that we set was 3288, but 
that does not include, and as it seems to me based on what I've heard, that we are enrolling students up to that target right now today, and we have an average of 30 move-ins each summer, and so we will probably be at least 18 to 20 students higher than that. We will exceed our target by quite a bit. Um, is that a correct assumption? Can you help me out? Yes, we also have move outs and our secondary students. The progression mm -hmm. study um, is about a net gain of 18. I, so we're new bills, I don't right. Remember from progression? So we're, ex yeah. we're still expecting to gain 18 students. If the past history holds true, yes. Right. Yeah. But in thinking of that, um, I would prefer to hold on some of these budget cuts. I understand the need to do ULA but I'm concerned about some of the, the choices in front of us, and then to make these and then undo them might be just as damaging as um, other choices. I am concerned particularly about the counseling position um, at the middle school and do not support that. Um, having a middle school student um, and seeing and knowing what the data is about the state of Minnesota for caseload for counselors, this will increase the caseload quite a bit. Um, this is cutting one third of the counselors, is that correct? Uh, at that building? Yes. And will increase the caseload to continue to move us downward when we should be moving upward. When we think about school safety, the things that are being recommended revolve around health and wellness and counselors. And we are making a proposal to cut a counselor. And that is very troubling to me. Um, and I'm still somewhat troubled by the B squad coaches. Um, those are not ULA positions. I don't know if that's something we need to decide tonight as we continue to look at other pieces. I think um, in previous years, Dr. Larson has done a very good job with the board in speaking to two ways to balance the budget. One is revenue generating and one is cuts. And I see lots of cuts, but I see very few ideas in terms of revenue generation beyond open enrollment. Before we've looked at busing fees for open enrollment students. We've looked, we haven't completely explored the impact of the fee increase for the athletics. And we have never finished really examining the concept of ad revenue. Um, that has been brought up in many other years. So I think there's still more work to be done. I understand that we do need to do ULAs tonight, and that makes sense. But some of these other things, until we continue and fully explore additional revenue sources, I am a little hesitant to just make all these cuts tonight. Just to comment on one thing, I had asked Bill about this earlier. On the counselor position, is that something, if the safe school money comes from the legislature, is that something that that position could be funded with? Yes. Safe schools money, though, is to increase our counselors, not maintain. I think the spirit of the law and the spirit of, of the piece from the legislation would be to increase. But it's also, it's to help schools ensure that they have counselors that they need. And so we're already doing that. It, it, it's it's not assumed that we're not doing what we're supposed to. It's to enhance. And so I, I understand it's to increase. But what if we were already at a really high number? It wouldn't be to increase. So it is to, as for a school district to use either for facilities or for um, uh, mental health counselors or whatever. So it's up to that district. So for us, our need is to, to get the, the position that is currently going to be cut. I'm, I'm not comfortable with that, and there's no guarantee that money is going to come through. With there's this no point. guarantee. I just I think it should be part of the discussion, though. Other comments? Yeah, sure. I could just point a clarification. Um, just for the minutes and, and for the record, we actually don't have any ULAs uh, oh. for the for approval tonight, which is rather remarkable considering we had 1.6 in a I deficit. I thought that was the next thing on the agenda. Non, non renewed contracts. Non Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you for just, thank, just as a point yes, semantic. Thank you very much for that clarification. Um, and then, and then one other just um, illustration. So, holding on any what we've brought before the board tonight um, balances the budget for next year. And from a revenue and expenditure standpoint, we will seek approval on June 14th. So, there is some time. Uh, however, holding on some of the reductions. Um, will in all likelihood cause the, the presentation to be uh, a deficit budget for next year. Um, now, I, I, it would be my recommendation to have that conversation on approving a debt 
given that we are in all likelihood out of compliance with our fund balance policy. Um, and if that's something that um, is, is what the board seeks to do, um, obviously that's fine. But I just I want to make sure that um, we don't get to June and we hold on some of the reductions and then we have a deficit budget uh, and then we don't we haven't had this conversation. So I want to make sure that's that's clear. What comments? Go ahead. Oh, what concerns me is the board is asked to make cuts, and we do our work and we make cuts. But then when it comes to adding things back in, we aren't consulted in the same sort of way. And so when we make these cuts, it puts us in a bad position because then we really don't have, um, we're not consulted in the same sort of way to say what comes back in first or what should be added in when we have surpluses. Um, and so I'm hesitant to cut, a few, especially the counselor. Um, and sort of lose control of that this early in the process when it seems to me that we're going to have at least another 18 students come in, which will change our budget number, which will be well beyond the target we set, which is another issue I think that needs to be addressed at some point. Other comments? I have another comment. Um, at the finance meeting, we did have uh, a pretty in-depth conversation about the B coaches I don't what did you miss that Lucy I can only hear parts of it because the backs returned to okay me. so the athletic director explained to us that he did come at this from a, a cut position and not a fee increase position and information was shared that if we did have a $35 increase that we would meet the need so we could keep all of our B coaches. But we already have an increase slated, and from the conversation at the high school earlier this week, that increase in fees has not played, has not been calculated out to know what the impact would be on these sports. So even if we went to knowing after doing that simple calculation that we can afford four of these coaches, that's a big difference. Or if the eight teams would know they have to raise money for half a coach's salary instead of a full coach's salary, that makes a difference. So I, we could not say what the fee increase right. was that we voted on, but, but Ray was able to explain that, that it was $5 for next year. Per Per student, per sport. So, so, so thirty-five dollars would take care of the forty thousand. Mm -hmm. Thirty-five dollars per student would would pay for all forty thousand dollars that we're looking at with that coach. And you know, I think that we all, uh, I think that we would all support the fact that the athletic spending accounts for approximately 2.7 percent of the gender f general fund expenditures and what we're proposing is that much of a cut percentage so um, I, you know it's it's my feeling as well that it would be more fair to share the costs because in in my opinion much like Matt Oswald spoke to in the general comment um, if, if we voted to cut the B coaches, it's my opinion that we could be cutting B programs across. Mm -hmm. Although Ray so, did assure us that that likely would not happen. But with, with, no with Title to... IX, there's no assurance. There's really no assurance. So the thing I would want to make sure of with this is because, I, and it's not in this, but it was somewhere in one of our communications that the booster club or, or somehow the, the, the community would to, would support this and teams could raise the money but what I'd want to make very clear is it's not up to the B teams to get this money it should be all of the athletic community should raise the money it, it should not be just on the B team families to come up with the money for this I don't think that's fair at all so I don't know how we articulate that here but I would want that to be very clear that if this is going to be a fee based and it sounds like you have thought of something that it could be across the board. That's the only way that, that that would really be acceptable because otherwise you're saying, oh, you didn't make the A team, you've got to pay more if you're, or you're just not going to get to play. And that's not okay. And I don't think our community would like to see something like that. Um, Lucy and I attended a listening session at the high school this week. And um, one of the coaches just mentioned, and this complicates it because most of the fundraising is done before the teams are selected. So you could be asking all of these students 
to be doing fundraising and then they would never make a team or have a team or have a team so I that's a complicating factor with the beat coaches so well, I'd like to speak in favor of the resolution as it's presented as difficult as it is there's nothing on this list that is a surprise really that we haven't seen several times coming forward it is a list generated by all of the administrators in the buildings who have worked very hard to do this and I don't think it's up to us to cherry pick this one or that one I think that we need to get on with it we need to make these difficult cuts and I really do support um, support the work that's been done here as difficult as it has been and I would like to see us uh, support it and write it in a way that you like so that these things you know it's not always the first thing back kind of thing but I, I have to speak in favor of it other comments Bill if this is due on the 30th is it and if we approve this today is it set in stone I mean it seems to me that we're looking for something to be solid set in stone with no certainty of what's going to happen in the next few months and you know could it be used as more of a guideline or a, a a living document to, uh, to be worked on between now and June 14th um, in some capacity where if we're seeing some more money coming in I mean if something changes between now and June 14th is it possible to make adjustments to the cuts um, you know I mean if it can be done I think it should be done but if we're voting to say yes right now for something that's due June 30th and I know we're under a crunch with everything going on I just I feel we're being a little quick but at the same time I mean if something happens where we can not do certain things between now and June 14th shouldn't we three years ago the legislature in an off session in a non budgetary year increased the general fund I want to say by $50 a student um, there's talk of safe schools money so if all of a sudden that were to be much higher than what we're expecting and there's no guarantee that would change you know when you get new information you make different decisions you know if all of a sudden we find out that we've had you know 10 students move in into say third grade that might change things um, and for example right now we're expecting to have 236 fifth grade students we have seven students that are on the list for open enrollment that are waiting if we were to accept all seven of them that would put us at 243 class sizes would go from 26.2 to 27.0 but that would be effectively cost neutral that would be about the cost of the teacher it's about those seven students uh, fourth grade we have uh, six students on the waiting list uh, 239 right now and if that were to go to 245 our class sizes would go to 26 uh, from 26.5 to 27.2 so not a huge increase in terms of class sizes and that would generate um, almost enough for the two teachers that you might add so um, there are ways in addition not just to cutting but that does go against what the board had said about the 3288 3,288 students so if it goes higher than that then we can expect um, to do things differently in terms of where we'd hire and so forth so I just want to repeat that I think um, it sounds good to say oh we could take more kids but I, I know it from what we've seen when when we take when the when the school district has let in too many open enrolled students how that affects a class size and and an entire um, group of kids in a, in a grade and so while it sounds good I think um, we've landed at a good number knowing that we're going to have a lot of kids possibly move in and so I, I don't feel like that's a great option um, as a as a source of revenue so I so I, I like that that was not part of this proposal I also do want to go back and say one more thing I I do agree with Lucy about the concern about losing the counselor especially one of our priorities of the board of this board is the health of our students and that goes towards that so um, so I wasn't meaning to diminish that oh maybe we can hope for money I, I, I do agree I think maybe that's why I'm so concerned about if if there is new money what will be first and and that's why you know we see some of these and we say okay it makes sense some of these are harder for us to and I, I don't mean to be cherry-picking Judy but you know when 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 you're living this and seeing it through the lens of what your kids are going through it's just there are certain things that are going to 
to stand out to us. So um, I, I think if there's a way to know or, or bring back in counselor, and, and so I, you know, I know that we need to move forward on it, and I think you, you've done a fantastic job, but there are still some things that, and that's why we're here. That's why we don't just come in and say yes and move on. We need to know um, what are some other options. Was anything else explored? Is there something that we could do to maybe address that position? Bill, uh, Mark, and the team who are sitting out in the audience, and it's quite a lot of different people worked on this. Um, I, I commend the thought and work that went into putting this all together. And I think, you know, I am hearing some pieces of this that are more, maybe a little more difficult to uh, take on than others. Um, Again, we're looking at the recommendations of the staff coming forward to say, this is what we think. That being said, I'd be interested if we could, this, this counselor middle school thing, when, when I saw it, I'm like, hmm. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to that, because there some, was rationale in that, and I, I wouldn't mind hearing it. Maybe the board wouldn't mind hearing it. Um, the other piece that I had was the timetable for this decision was based on ULAs, right? For the most part, that was like we had to have this piece kind of handled because of that. And so that now is not, as I understand it, not the driving factor. There are no ULAs in your board packet tonight. There are non-renewed contracts. Yeah. And is, is the, is the de same deadline tonight on those? Well, the deadline for both ULAs, um, if it's for financial reasons, is not the April 1st that I've heard communicated. It's actually much later. Really the reason why we're bringing both ULAs and, and non-renewed contracts, uh, they would be together at the same time, is really out of respect uh, to notify staff at a reasonable time of their employment status for next year. That's, that's, really, that's really the reason why the time-sensitive portion of it. Are we able to hear the rationale? Sorry for putting you on the spot. Um, I think I've said this before that um, we don't like any of our decisions. <laughs> so please understand that. We don't like anything that we had to cut. Um, our our rationale is when we are, we're told that we had to cut between three hundred and four hundred thousand dollars in our building, that that a lot of that comes with from personnel, um, and we did take a cut. Um, our our first plan was to move from ten sections in each grade level, so that means each teacher teaches five classes. Um, and we have two teams, so it's 10 classes of science, 10 of English, 10 of social studies, and we moved it down to nine. Um, when, and I would just note that right now we are too short of um, the projected numbers for the middle school for next year. All of, uh, we have, um, those open enrollment numbers, those students have accepted, they've registered, and right at this point, we are just two students short of that projected number. Um, with moving to nine sections um, in sixth grade, our class sizes are at 30. Um, in seventh grade, they will be at 30. At nine sections for eighth grade, they would be over 32. Um, and to try to keep um, those class sizes at a reasonable number, um, we chose that a counseling position would be cut. Not that we like that idea, <laughs> um, but we were trying to keep our class sizes at a manageable size and um, really not wanting to go over that 32 number for a middle school class. Um, that's our only rationale 
not liking anything. In the board packet, it talked about um, strategies that the middle school would um, is or would employ to minimize the impact of the loss of counselor. Um, there's restorative justice, some, some, some things, some strategies that would lessen that impact. Can you speak to that at all? I mean, I think that's what I was trying to. Okay, uh, okay. Just that it's the uh, at least bad thing. Right. Um, I, I just. We have implemented some restorative practices in our building and uh, myself and Chelsea Paquetta, um, interventionist specialist have um, been leading those um, and I would say that uh, we have done with our that pre some of that training and some of our equity training within um, our staff development time that our our teachers, our mindsets for our teachers is shifting, that they're able to, um, they, they're amazing, <laughs> and they are able to care for lots of kids throughout the school day, to recognize when a student needs help, to um, refer that student to either our interventionist specialist, our school psychologist, our, our two counselors, our three counselors that we have now, and to use those two counselors that we have. Uh, and if you're in our building, you know that there's lots of teacher counseling happening and also uh, in the main office <laughs> and our school nurse. Uh, so I feel that our staff has really um, they, they know middle school kids, they can identify a lot of needs, they help a lot of kids right within their classes. If we can keep their class sizes manageable also. So it's, it, we're walking that fine line as we go through that. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Other comments? I, I would like to thank Bill for the the patients in answering the hundreds of questions because there have been a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm surprised you're not in like a rehab or something. <laughs> oh. Um, I had so a, the recommendation. Oh, I'm sorry. Would it, I'm, I'm reading preliminary and then I'm reading um, for final approval June 14th. If you could explain what that is. Great question. So. Uh, for anybody that may not have heard, the difference between preliminary and final and why those two are interrelated in the memo. Um, by statute, the board is required to approve a preliminary budget by June 30th. Now what I, what I said was uh, final approval of the preliminary budget and why you call it the preliminary budget and some districts have gone so far as to call it the first budget is because typically with your fiscal year starting on July 1st, the board's required to approve the first budget or the preliminary budget in June. You get halfway through your school year, uh, you have your fiscal audit done, you have your levy certified for the next year, you have some actuals for that year, updated enrollment, um, maybe some contract settlements, and you find out what the state's gonna do in the terms of the funding formula. A lot of unsettled uh, items when you approve the preliminary budget, so typically, the revised budget for the current year then comes in December or January, right? So the preliminary budget before the fiscal year, revised budget uh, in December or January. One, budget two, I'm indifferent, whatever we want to use. Thanks, I, didn't, I wasn't sure, thank you. Any other questions? I think we need a motion. So the recommendation from uh, business manager and the superintendent is to approve the presentation as presented. Is there a motion? I'll move to accept it. For a second? I'll second it. Please put it on the table for a conversation. Any additional discussion? I move to amend I move to amend the motion to remove the school counselor from this part of the approval process. For a second to be amended? Right. Can we amend a second time? 
You can amend as many times as you want, but you can't do another amendment till this amendment's been taken care of. Okay. I second. So the motion is to approve, at the moment, the motion is to approve the budget res resolution as presented with the removal of the counselor. Everybody agree to that? If you do a vote on the amendment. All of those in favor of that amended, um, the amendment. which is removing the counselor. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'd, I'd like to offer a second amendment. Okay. I'd like to move that we remove the, um, the, rem the uh, elimination of the B coaches until more, um, more options can be examined on that, if, as far as if it is in a fee increase or, or another funding source such as ad revenue or anything else. Second that. We need a motion to approve that amendment. Julie made the motion, Mike seconds, we need a vote. This is discussion. Well yeah, discussion. I have a question. That's forty thousand dollars we're putting back on the table. What was the cost of the counselor that we just Okay. 70 ish. Yeah. 70 ish? So that's going to put us in 110 in the hole. And 18 students coming in this summer through move ins would bring in how much money? $180,000. Okay. But we will not. There's no guarantee on those students, but history has shown, and you're predicting 18 based upon what's written here, I correct? Am. Yes. Okay. So we will see a deficit budget. And then if we have those 18 students move in, we'll reflect that in the revised budget for next year. But in June, we will see a deficit budget. Unless we can figure out the ad revenue. Right, things, something. Things of that nature. Right. We'll continue to work on that. Just to us. continue to explore options. Okay. All in favor oh, of this oh, amendment. Stacy. I'm discussing, oh, sorry. sorry. So I'm just wondering if, um, if I, it won't, I can't change this amendment, but if you would be open instead to, instead of removing them from this, because then we're voting on a budget with a deficit. <laughs> if it's, um, if you'd rather have language in there that says, if this revenue comes in, these are first priority. We can do that in a separate motion, though, too. So if we take it out of here, all we've asked is to have these items pulled out. And so after this, if we can get the rest, the, the bulk of it approved, then we could do a motion to approve these with conditions. But then we've passed a budget that isn't. No, I mean, immediately after this motion. Oh, sure. Okay. So, I mean, all Julie right now is doing is pointing it out of this motion. And so once this motion is resolved, then the next motion could be from someone on the board saying, I would like to move that item forward with these conditions. Then you have to put them back in. You can do them separately, though. You can approve them in two consecutive motions instead of one, one motion. All Julie's asking is to pull this out right now. Okay. Okay. And then there could be a separate motion to do what add you're saying, in. to add them back in with okay. those conditions. Okay. I think it's just cleaner. Yeah, I agree. So we pulled out the counselor, and now this is an amendment to pull out the B coaches. Do we have a vote on all those in favor of that amendment to pull out the B coaches? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. So that's 4 four 2. Amendment carries. Oh, you were opposed? I'm opposed. So now I'd like to make an amendment to add them back in. I and think just with can, I don't think you can do that to well, the that's motion. What you just said. Well, after this motion is clear, then you can do a new motion oh, to deal good. with that piece of it. You see what I'm saying? So you want to, my understanding from what you said, Stacey, is you would like to um, have them put back in the budget cuts with some conditions. Yes. Once this motion clears, as it's been amended, then we've only done the amendments to the motion, not the actual motion itself. So currently the motion that needs to be on the table is as approved, minus the B coaches, minus the counselor. So we're voting on that, correct? All That's my understanding. In favor of that, say aye. 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 
I'm 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 now. Uh, now you can make a motion. I'm sorry. Are we still, we have not moved this budget yet then. Is that right? No, we just moved everything except those two items we removed. Oh, now That's what you just voted on. So, sorry. And that was 6-0, right? Yes. Okay. And now you can make okay. a motion. Okay. So, well, I mean, I made my point earlier. It, so I moved to add them in with the caveat that this be explored if the money is, if the revenue is, if we can determine another way for the revenue, then they'll be the first to be funded. That's your motion? That's my is motion. There a second. I'll second it. Could you repeat the motion for me, please? Um, to include the 8B squad coaches on the list of the budget reduction with the caveat that and new revenue, I'm sorry? And the counselor? And the counselor. But that wasn't. That wasn't in the that motion that was just seconded. Motion. No, just, oh, yeah. just the, the, the B coaches because the counselor will be funded. Right, add them back in to say with the caveat that with the new revenue they would be funded first. It's just. They've been taken off the. the exactly. Right, like the, the point the, I was the, trying the, to make was now we've passed a, a budget that isn't. We didn't pass balanced. a budget though. No, no, no. We only saw on the amendment, but that's what we'll be doing if we don't add these back in. Right. So, I, I just. I think what she wants to do is to add them back with the. Go ahead and put, cut them, but the caveat is that if we have any funds at all, yes. these get funded yeah. first to get them back in. I think it that's. It would be said. given the priority. With extra emphasis to find a way of a, a source of revenue. She wants to cut them and then have a priority to uncut them. But they're just not cut right now. I know. Okay. So, I, I think, Stacey, are you trying to, I mean. I'm trying to avoid passing a budget that isn't right. balanced. But the budget isn't due till June. I think there's still a lot of information, resources, and things that can happen. I think it'd be more appropriate to ask that both these items come back as we continue to look at the budget and other options and scenarios. I think these could still be two things we might need to do. I just feel it's too early to do so we could still add the B coaches. Line. Yeah. For, for, the prelim for the final budget, because this is just the preliminary. So, and when will we, when would we do that? will come on June 14th so um, if I'm understanding correctly if I if I could we will research ad revenue things like fees gate receipts if we can come up with some answers on that yes. uh, we could bring that before the board before June 4th yes. which could potentially increase the revenue thereby balancing the budget or we could come to the board and and state why we would not be able to do that and then the budget would remain in a deficit position. So we could be adding it back in, Stacy. It's the same thing. Okay. I, I think, okay. I think, your, goal, I, I think I, your goal is met. I withdraw with that. my motion. My confusion, okay. confusion there. Thank you. Okay. Um, and just, just to be clear, um, an option is not to increase the uh, total enrollment. For example, there's three students that have uh, applied for open enrollment in the secondary at the high school level that would generate about thirty thousand dollars of revenue. Um, <laughs> <coughs> three fourths of that issue, but that's not an option. We are not doing anything about our target. Aren't we well above our target though already? I mean, our target was 3288. We've we're more than that currently, and we've got the potential for 18 move-ins. So we're well above our target right, already. We're not building a budget on phantom and not yet students, and so right. these are just the people that are right. signed and sealed. So. Right. And I think we all care that next fall is when the section. Uh, reassignments are done. All the counts are redone next fall. So every student, every school. student matters at the high school. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. All right, personnel. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, the recommendation to approve employment for licensed personnel who will continue to be on probationary status for the 2018-2019 school year. This includes Jamie Chamberlain. Jill Dimitri, Amy Ritchie, Elise Sinko, Caitlin Swisher, Carly Vale, and Mahala Valentino. Recommendation is to approve as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 
Number two is a recommendation to approve contract status for licensed personnel moving from probationary status to continuing contract status for the 2018-2019 school year. This includes Ellen Cole, Julie Edwards, Catherine Fastner, Laura Harlstead, Kelsey Joson, Gail Kowski, Courtney McCormick, Jennifer Tantu, and Kelly Wilkie. The recommendation is to approve as presented. So moved. Second. I have a question on that group. Uh, I'm looking at 2E, and 2E was also included for a half-time FTE leave next year. Can we approve that? So are we approving a full contract or a half contract for that person? Because if you look at some of these others, they're like 0 0.2, 0 0.4. Um, are we approving a, a full or a 0.5 because of the leave? Um, a a full-time contract and then in the consent agenda, a half-time leave. We already approved a half-time leave, though. So won't this have to be a half-time approval of a contract? But she, if she would be a half-time approval of a contract, then the leave would be that 0 0.5. That 0.25. But do we need, the, I mean, are we replacing that 0.5? If we're not replacing that 0.5, we don't need 0.5 of a teacher then. We're renewing a contract for additional that we don't need. Can you, Ms. Sorensen, can you speak to that? We did have some cuts to our fire and health department, um, a 0.5 reduction. And, um, Kelsey is um, just finished her pr probationary period, so she's becoming um, a continuing contract, but she has also asked for a 0.5 um, leave for this coming year. But we can only staff for what we need, so we need 0.5. Although she's volunteered to do that, should we be putting her on a contract larger than we need for the district, and it should be a 0.5, wouldn't it? Because that's what we need to staff to, not what what she, I mean, so I understand she's taking a leave, but what does the district need to staff to? Um, in our building, a th 3.5. Okay. And so she is filling that 0.5 position. Right. So why are we approving a 0 0.10 when we only need 3.5 and this would be the 0.5? We, we actually still need to fill a 0.8 at the high school. So that's open. We will be posting for that 0.8 at the high school. So. Because of the shifts within the FIAD, we actually need a 0 0.8 up at the high school because of Deb Driscoll's retirement. So we will need a person to replace that. So that's why she would be continuing contract status and um, have the rights to that if she came back. And then the person that we hire now coming up would be lower in seniority, say if she chose to come back, she would be or he or she. Okay, thank you for that clarification. There was a motion already. Yeah. All in favor yeah. say aye. 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 Uh, number three, approval of resolution to terminate the non renewed probationary teaching contracts. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of the resolution. The resolution relating to the termination and non renewal of teaching contract, uh, whereas the teacher, and I'll read the names Janina Boscovich, Taryn Boyd, Bryce Alveson, Brent Evander, Devin Goose, Holly Hillstrom, Daniel Jaderholm. Adrian Stolberg and Will, William Thorson be resolved by the school district of in, by school board of independent school district number 832 that pursuant to Minnesota statute 122A.40 subdivision 5 the teaching contract of those people a probationary teaching independent school district number 832 is hereby terminated at the close of the current 2017-18 school year be it further resolved that written notice be sent to said teacher regarding termination and non-renewal of his or her contract as provided by law, and that said notice shall be in substantially the following form. And there's an example of it in the in your packet. Motion is to approve as presented. Your motion. I have a question before the motion. Three A is part of a cut we did not make, so can we cut that position still? Yes, we still can. Um, that, that's the personnel, not the position. So you, even though we're keeping the position, you're still recommending cutting the personnel? Yes. So we'd search for a new one? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Is there a motion? A motion to approve these? This resolution to terminate and non-renew. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Committee reports. AMSD? I uh, have not. They don't uh, meet till tomorrow, so okay. nothing for today. Julie, Dave? Um, as, I, as I shared earlier, um, the, party is coming. the party is coming um, April 28th. I hope that everyone has their ticket. Um, um, we let's see okay what else did we talk about that night um, their their big open party this year will be an anniversary party celebrating MAPES 30 years that's the big sign up party that they do every year at the gala and that will be a November 9th party at Delwood with a local band singing it will be $30 each and, and typically you can sign up for that even after the gala um, again, May 16th, Scholarship Night. May 17th, the Hill Legacy Night. Um, busy time of year. And then next week is a Celebration of Excellence. Did you want to announce the Hill Legacy Award winner? C can, you announce, can you announce his name? Bob Schneeweiss. Yeah, I, oh. I don't know how to say his last name. So. Long standing. He used to be on the school board. Yeah. He used to be a May board trustee. Uh, he has done uh, work with St. Jude's and uh, th uh, a whole host of different community good causes. Uh, if you look hard enough, you'll see Bob there uh, working away. So a great, a great person. Yep. And uh, again, I would hope that this board could put <coughs> on their calendar since Century College, May 17th, 6:30, and uh, <coughs> it's, a, it's a good night. So. Yes. Thank you. School board? So you should have all seen in the uh, daily and weekly announcements from the School Board Association that Kathy Green, our president of our State School Board Association, has been appointed, elected to the National School Board Association Board to represent the central region. Um, so we're very proud of her. There was a change in, in the board with the representative who represented our district before um, being from Ohio, moving up to a secretary position, and so she was elected to fill that spot. So it's very exciting for the state of Minnesota. There's minutes for the 916 board in your packet. Any other, any other reports? Yes, the Community Education Advisory Council. Um, just want to point out that registration is underway for summer camps and classes and school age care and many other activities. Um, and I'd like to highlight that recently uh, one program that they did that was very successful is they had 48 seniors who were served at the AARP tax prep with um, the uh, third and final session I think was held uh, just on Tuesday of this week. So I think that's a great benefit to our community. and. Um, the upcoming things have already been mentioned, the Rite of Spring and the uh, community lunch on May 2nd. Okay, any others? Uh, this morning there was a PTO meeting and I just want to let you know it went really well, uh, but the elementary PTO is really s still concerned about uh, cell phone usage in the schools and so um, I th just want to let the board know that and I mentioned it in the past that we may be having to discuss, taking a look at that at some point maybe in, in at our study session or are you? something so okay. Okay. Uh, the EEA Education Equity Alliance advisory uh, between Matamidi and North St. Paul Maple Oakdale the meeting for April 30th has been canceled it got canceled also when we had the snow uh, situation closed school so it shut that down so it's just done for the year is my understanding and uh, the equity person at North St. Paul uh, Oakdale, uh, B, um, what's his last name, B, what's that? Kong, Kong thank you, um, is going back into the classroom and so he was kind of a big part of this. So the idea was just, and uh, with Mark's uh, retirement, the idea was just to start it back up in the fall. Um, well, Lucy and I have, as you probably um, are aware, Lucy and I are changing places. 
Uh, she's doing the reporting, obviously, for MSBA. It makes a lot of sense because she's on that board now. And I'm taking over this really hard assignment, uh, the Metro Exu uh, deal. And, uh, you know, I, it, it, I look at the two assignments I have, and, and it's, a, it's one meeting a year between the two of them. So uh, let's see. Um, also, uh, I got a call from the MSBA lobbyist today, Denise Dietrich, and asked me to come down and share information on that. Our experience was school start time, so I agreed to come down and do that um, piece. And then uh, the last thing I have is the Alumni of Distinction, which is an, a, life, a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, for a, a, a Montemita High School graduate, um, is open now for nominations. And um, we have until May 10th, I think that's the date, to make nominations for people that have graduated from our schools that have done wonderful, wonderful work. And um, so if you know anyone, uh, anybody in the audience knows anybody that should get this Lifetime Achievement, it's, it's uh, an award, it's a very deserving award, and, and there's some amazing things that our graduates do. And um, we don't always get as many uh, nominations as it would be nice. We, we have so many deserving alumni, but we don't always get the the application so uh, it's a very easy I nominated someone last year it's a very easy you can do the nomination in probably half hour it's pretty pretty easy to do and I so I would encourage us to look for people that are I'd, I'd like to make a quick clarification it doesn't have to be lifetime achievement so someone in their 30s could also be recognized as an alumni yeah right but I don't want it to appear that it has to be a, a person of a certain age but I mean it, it is truly amazing the yes. the different people that are out there um, and you know, I've, I've met some of these people, and it's just really pretty incredible. So um, let's try to get some nominations in. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Um, th this is the tax weekend that everyone's kind of aware of, and there's always a lot of, a little bit of angst about that. A lot of people are able to do the taxes themselves online or some other way, um, but a lot of people have to go to an expert. And if you have a complicated situation, you, use, you would use an expert. Um, I've changed oil in my car before and the air filters and stuff like that, but when we had a nail in the tire, I didn't know what to do, so I took it down the road here. They took care of it. I relied on an expert. We've had medical issues in our family from time to time, and when we're not certain what to do, if we can't fix it ourselves, we refer to an expert. I want to thank the principals, director of teaching and learning, director of business management, um, personnel, all the people that have worked so hard, and I really appreciate your expertise. We rely on your expertise to make decisions and recommendations, and I know they weren't easy or pleasant or fun, but we need to rely on experts, and I've relied on you, and I appreciate the work that you've done with that. I think expertise is something that's very, very important, and so your work, I appreciate it, and thank you. And so. I would second all of that. Me too. We need a motion to adjourn. Second. Meetings adjourned. All in favor, say aye. Aye. aye.